but there's nowhere else like this in Wales. Penrhys is located in the Ronda Valleys, but it's not actually in a valley, it's on a mountain top. What awards did it win? World's ugliest estate? I don't care what decade you're in, please don't paint your house grey. The council forcefully moved people on- You are not allowed to visit this ghost town in California. It is filled with hundreds of abandoned houses completely surrounded by barbed wire fencing with many no trespassing and warning signs posted. It was mostly abandoned by the mid-1980s and to this day still has 24-hour security. Some say a deadly outbreak caused its residents to flee, while some say otherwise. To start off our list today, we are going to take a deep dive into Dudley Town, Connecticut, also known as the town that never existed, or the Village of the Damned. The town was settled in the 1740s and thrived for a while before falling victim to disease, crop failure, and mysterious unexplained death, which began taking place shortly after the Dudley family came to visit. Many villagers believed that the family had arrived with a curse brought from England to damn the residents of the town. So, shortly after the misfortune started, Dudley Town's abandonment began as many villagers fled for their lives in fear. Which was a pretty good call, I guess, because it is said that those who stayed began to slowly descend into the realm of insanity, one by one, with many claiming to have witnessed strange creatures emerging from the forest surrounding the town. Those who enter that same forest today tell of a deafening silence that feels eerily thick and almost suffocating. Reports of aggressive animals along the town's hiking trails desperate screams coming from the treetops, and the fact that many people and pets have mysteriously gone missing in the area over the years might be a few reasons why the town remains abandoned and illegal to enter to this day, which honestly just makes me wonder what other secrets might be hiding within its historically dark parameters. All right, next up we have La Noria in Chile. Now, when I describe this place, it's gonna sound like I'm exaggerating, but I'm really not. There are tons of videos of people exploring this ghost town and it looks exactly what it sounds like when described. An incredibly creepy abandoned town with bones, some human, a lot human, scattered around the place. Open coffins, crosses everywhere. It's really quite the vibe. This place sits in the Atacama Desert. It was once a bustling mining town, but when the mines dried up, the people started new lives, but their dead were left behind. And as the years went on, people would come to this place and loot it. Even coffins would be opened up and items like jewelry they'd been buried with would be stolen. So tons of graves now sit out in the open with the bones of the dead still sitting inside of them. So it probably comes as no surprise that people will claim to see some unexplained things going on here, especially at night. Shadowy figures or even just full-bodied apparitions. And of course, the haunting sounds of the angered spirits are said to echo through the night as well. Alrighty, next up we have an ancient town with some pretty sadistic sacrificial rituals. Well, not so much a town as a temple in a town, specifically the Moch Temple located in the northwest of Peru. The temple thrived between 100 and 800 AD. The people of the town were known for producing sophisticated goods for their time, including hand-painted pottery made from molds. They also were incredibly advanced when it came to goldworking, monument construction, and city planning. While at one time, the town was well known for their advancements, including their incredibly efficient irrigation systems, in 1995 they became known for something a bit different. You see, archaeologists discovered a huge sacrificial gravesite near the temple filled with the bodies of male sacrificial victims who likely did not go willingly. As it is believed, many of them were travelers who met their unfortunate ends while crossing the Mochu land in search of their final destinations. Murals on the walls of the temple illustrate the men's final moments moments, showing them naked and hogtied before being slaughtered after which the men's skulls were turned into cups used to collect the BLOOD of the deceased so that it may be offered up as a gift to the gods. Super gross. Next, we head over to China to discuss Kowloon Walled City. Unlike pretty much every spot on this list, I think this place would have actually been uh, much scarier before it was abandoned. The Kowloon Walled City was this crazy, super dense, and sort of chaotic place in Hong Kong. Picture a bunch of cramped, towering buildings all squished together, a giant concrete jungle. Back in the Song Dynasty around 960 to 1279 AD, there was this cool walled garrison in Kowloon. Over time, it got kind of abandoned, and during the British colonial period, nobody really bothered about it. People just started building random structures within its walls. Fast forward to the 20th century, and it turned 
into this insane unplanned mega city within a city. The buildings were like a tangled mess of staircases, pipes, and wires. It became famous for being overcrowded, and it was also basically lawless. The only ones really governing the place were the triads. It was tons of crime, and it was very dark. Because of how dense the place was, it was hard for natural light to even reach the lower levels of the city, so people had to go to the roofs of their buildings to get any light. Eventually, in the 90s, the Hong Kong government decided the place needed to go and demolition began in March of 1993. Today though, some of the ruins still remain. Next up we've got the Bangar Fort located in Rajasthan, India. The small town was built in the 17th century by an emperor named Madho Singh as a testament of love to his son Man Singh. At its peak, the town was home to over 10,000 people. Today, living in the town is prohibited. And while while tourists and locals may visit the ruins during the day, they are strictly banned from entering the area before sunrise and after sunset. And this is because of the fact that since Bangar Fort's re-establishment as an unaltered landmark in the 21st century, people who have entered the premises during these times have often heard or seen dark spirits. And those who have gone into the forts have either turned up dead or just not turned up at all. Because of this, each night before the sun sets, the forts and the grounds are evacuated, locked, and guarded. This is also why the area has earned the title of most haunted place in India. Many believe the haunting is due to a curse placed on the town during its peak by hermit Baba Baloo, who was living in the area at the time. Shortly after he declared his curse, a devastating earthquake hit the town, causing its people, along with the people from 83 surrounding villages, to vanish overnight. Next on the list is Poveglia Island in Italy. This place has a rather ominous nickname, Ghost Island and that's not just because nobody lives there. This island is basically a mix of a former hospital and a big giant graveyard. So back in the day during the bubonic plague in the 1700s, which was a very fun time, they used Paveglia as a quarantine spot. It was the place you'd get dumped when you were really sick. And then later on, they built a mental hospital there. So it went from a plague quarantine spot, pretty dark already, to a place where even more horrible things happened because mental hospitals were never pleasant and the inmates were never treated well. The hospital eventually closed in the 60s, and the island's been abandoned ever since. So many people died on this island that half of the soil is apparently made up of their remains, which is just wild. Today, the island is completely off limits because for some reason, people need to be told not to go to a place like this. Next up, we've got Koldara, yet another town in Rajasthan, India, with a pretty sordid past. It is said that around 300 years ago, Kaldara was quite a prosperous village where townsfolk lived happily and, despite the area's dry agriculture, were able to grow incredibly abundant crops throughout the years. It wasn't until the arrival of a debaucherous Prime Minister, Salem Singh, that things started to go downhill. When Salem arrived in the town, he set his sights on a beautiful young woman. He claimed he would marry her by any means necessary, including force. He warned the villagers that any attempt to protect the girl and thwart the marriage would result in grave consequences for their lands. And so, the villagers basically said screw it. The entire population of the town, including the young woman that Salim had hoped to marry, left Kaldara. But not before they put a dark curse on its barren lands, ensuring that Salim would never be able to reap the ill earned rewards of what the villagers had sown. To this date, the small town of Kaldara remains abandoned, in almost the same state it had been left in so many years ago, minus the fruitful harvests, of course. Those who have visited the ancient grounds have told of dark forces that they feel are determined to protect the uninhabitable status of the area, as per the villagers' curse, which had been designed so that no one would ever be able to settle in the area again. Next on the list, we have the largest contaminated site in the southern hemisphere, Wittenoom, in western Australia. Australia. This town was surrounded by asbestos mines. There were rich asbestos deposits in the surrounding hills, and back in the day, asbestos was in high demand, being used in construction as a fire resistant and for insulation. So the town grew pretty rapidly as miners and their families settled in the area. Wittenoom was a bumping community. There were schools, shops, a movie theater, but 
As the years went on and concerns about the health risks associated with asbestos exposure began to be a thing, it became pretty obvious that people were living in a death trap. By the 60s and 70s, the health hazards of asbestos became a well-known thing and the demand for it really dried up. The Wittenoom mine closed in 1966, which had pretty much been the sole source of income for the town. And on top of that, the negative health effects were starting to become pretty apparent. By the 2000s, the town had officially been shut down and only a handful of holdouts remained. But as of 2022, there's no one left and in 2023, the place started getting demolished completely. Okay, next on our list today, we have Cinco Saltos, an Argentinian town with a pretty dark past, obviously. The area in which the town resides receives very little sunlight, providing it with a quite fittingly dark and gloomy aura year round. On many occasions, Cinco Saltos has been referred to as the city of witches. This being largely due to the fact that historically, many residents of the area had been dedicated practitioners of black magic, namely, necromancy and witchcraft. It is said that in ancient times, witches would often perform occult rituals in the town. One of the more commonly performed was a ritualistic sacrifice of young men and women on the Pellegrini Lake that ran through the center of the town. It is said that to this day, anyone who stands near the lake at night comes to know the disembodied screams of the many victims said to have lost their lives by the river so long ago. And lastly, we have probably the most apocalyptic looking place on the list. Centralia in Pennsylvania. The town's streets are cracked and smoke constantly rises from the ground. It's hard to believe this place actually exists. It looks like a set from The Walking Dead, but that's because a coal mine fire has been burning beneath the town since 1962. The story begins with a landfill fire that was intentionally ignited near an abandoned coal mine entrance. Unfortunately, the fire unexpectedly spread to the coal mines beneath the town, creating a continuous underground blaze that just hasn't stopped and this has caused some problems primarily all the sinkholes imagine a sinkhole opening up with fire spewing out of it like you'd think you were literally being dragged into hell so yeah people don't live here anymore shocker most of the buildings have now been demolished in the 80s the US government allocated funds to relocate the remaining residents and the local zip code was discontinued and is Maple Hill Cemetery founded in 1822 this cemetery is the oldest and largest burial ground in the state where roughly 80,000 people have been laid to rest. But with that many souls in one place, it only takes a matter of time before people start noticing something strange happening. While during the day, you may be spared from witnessing a horrifying spirit, it's said at night the tortured souls are unearthed, roaming the grounds in search of answers. Most unsettling is the park on the property, also known as the Dead Playground. Oh gee, that sounds inviting, don't you think? Apparently it's nicknamed that as many young people are buried in the area. And visitors brave enough to see for themselves what goes on claim that at night the trapped souls of the young can be seen playing around the park while their creepy giggles echo throughout the grounds. But whatever you do, make sure you pay respect to Mary Bibb. If you knock on her mausoleum walls, she will reply with a gentle creak of her rocking chair buried inside. But if you forget to greet her, well, she just might haunt haunt you forever. Coming in at number 9 is Fort Morgan. Said to be one of the most haunted places in all of Alabama, Fort Morgan is rife with ghoulish tales of ghosts and strange occurrences. The most notorious is that of a prisoner who's said to have died here in the early 1900s after he took his own life in the barracks. People say that if you walk past, you can still hear him crying out late at night. But he's not the only one you should fear. There's also a female spirit that wanders the grounds in search of justice after she too lost her life after being dragged into the fort and beaten to death by mysterious attackers who were never caught for the crime. Many believe she is an angry spirit with a vengeance who will torture any man who steps foot on the property. So if I were you, I'd skip this one. Next up at number 8 is Drish House. Once the home of Dr. John R. Marsh, a gambler and a drunk who built the estate in 1835 for his beloved bride Sarah. The couple lived in the home for 32 years until one day John had too much to drink for the last time and drunkenly tumbled over the stairway falling to his demise. But you might be surprised that it's not his spirit that's trapped here, actually his wife Sarah. While no one knows for sure what keeps 
her soul trapped on the property. Some say she was so traumatized after finding her husband dead in their home and wasn't able to recover. Others believe, however, that she refuses to leave because her family failed to honor her own funeral wishes, and so she remains causing trouble to anyone who steps foot on the property to this day. While today the manor is used for many celebrations, Sarah remains tormenting guests of the events, trying to get them to leave. If you're brave enough to visit, try looking up at the third story tower. It says you can catch a glimpse of her up there. Just be careful she doesn't see you looking, or she may just follow you around the property, terrorizing you until you leave. Next up at number 7, the Old Bryce Hospital. There are few places in this world more haunted than an old, abandoned mental health facility. And there is no denying that the torment that went on here is a huge reason as to why so many spirits remain haunting its grounds, seeking revenge. Built during the segregation era of America, the building was branded as an insane asylum for those suffering from mental illnesses, when in reality, it was pretty much a work camp for able-bodied black people who were admitted under false pretenses and then forced into slave labor, working in the fields around the hospital. Shockingly, the facility remained open until 1977, and only closed due to new desegregation laws. It comes as no surprise that after years of abuse and inhumane living conditions suffered by the so-called patients, that people claim to have had strange experiences while visiting. Those who've dared to visit the abandoned hospital claim the souls are angry, and that as soon as you walk in, you can feel the air shift. Many report hearing strange noises, and some even claim to have seen shadowy figures lurking around every corner. Next up at number 6 is St. James Hotel. For whatever reason, hotels tend to be a pretty big hotspot for paranormal encounters, and the St. James Hotel is definitely a part of that phenomenon. Back in the day it was built, it was the first hotel operated by a black congressman, and despite having many years of success, it hit hard times in the late 1800s and was eventually forced to close its doors to the public. Fast forward about 100 years to 1997 and the hotel reopened, but this time something was off about the building, something just wasn't right. During its century long time as an abandoned building, it became a horrifying hub for lost souls, and I guess they decided to remain, haunting all those that dare stay the night. Visitors claim seeing full bodied apparitions sitting at the bar, or witness lights shutting off out of nowhere. But most creepy of all was a recorded visit when a psychic research team was brought in and they walked the grounds asking if anyone was there, but they never heard a response. Back. But later on, when they played the tapes, an older man's voice responded saying, Well, that's a stupid question, making everyone in the room jump. So, what do you say? Are you brave enough to pay the ghosts a visit? Coming in at number 5, Cahaba Ghost Town. It likely comes as no surprise that a ghost town is also home to thousands of unsettling spirits, but few are more terrifying than Cahaba. Once the capital city of Alabama, it was abandoned after the Civil War when terrible flooding led to most of the buildings falling into complete disrepair, and so the citizens who survived were forced to leave for good. Today, nothing remains but the the ruins of what used to be, including a church, a few cemeteries, and the Barker Mansion and its slave quarters. And I mean, that is just all the ingredients for a haunted ghost town, if I've ever heard of one. Those that have tried to visit the once booming city recount that as soon as you enter the town's borders, cell service gets spotty and unreliable, only to be completely fine as soon as you step even one foot off the border of the town. While that alone might not scare visitors away, there are also countless reports of visitors witnessing terrifying apparitions and hearing the voices of the dead crying out at night for revenge. So visit at your own risk, but don't say I didn't warn you. Coming in at number 4 is the Boynton Oak. Of all the things that are usually haunted, like cemeteries, hospitals, churches, the last thing you'd likely expect to need to be afraid of was a tree. But trust me, this is no ordinary tree. The Boynton Oak is said to have grown from the grave of one Mr. Charles Boynton. As the legend goes, back in 1835, Charles was accused of 
friend Nathaniel Frost. Charles disputed the accusation and never once wavered from his alleged innocence. Still, he was found guilty for the crime and sentenced to execution as payback. But right before he was executed, he declared in front of everyone that a tree would spring forth from his grave as a proof of his innocence, and then they would all see that they had caught the wrong man. And shockingly, this is exactly what happened. Many claim that Charles's spirit haunts the tree above his grave, often freaking out those who come to visit. Even spookier is that some claim to have even seen him sitting under the tree waiting. But just who is he waiting for? No one knows exactly. Coming in at number three is Sloss Furnaces. Once built as a means to access iron ore, coal, and limestone, the Sloss Furnaces were far from a safe place to work. It's believed over the years at least 47 men lost their lives working at the furnaces due to the incredibly dangerous work conditions. But the most talked about is that of James Slag Wormwood, a former foreman of the furnaces known for being cruel to his employees and who died after slipping and falling into a pool of molten iron ore. Although there is rumor he may have been pushed by his workers forced to the brink after his unending abuse. Still, after Wormwood's death, strange things started happening more and more frequently. Workers were seeing strange things, hearing strange noises, and started to feel like they were going crazy. Employees were being found injured or seen tripping and falling out of nowhere. Each of them recounted that an angry man covered in burns had tried to push them after screaming at them to get back to work. Then in 1971, a watchman encountered what he described as a half man, half demon who tried to push him up the stairs. After the watchman refused the spirit's advance, he was badly beaten by the entity until he fell unconscious. Later while being examined, he was found to be covered in severe burns where he says he was beaten. So unless you're looking to be beaten up by an angry spirit and covered in burns from the blows. I might suggest a different place for your visit. Coming in at number two is Bear Creek Swamp. Even at the best of times, swamps give off spooky and creepy vibes, and this one might just be the worst of them all. Legend has it that many years ago, a woman's son went missing. Scared, the mother went looking for him in the nearby swamp, hoping that he had simply run away from home. But no matter how long she looked, she could never find him. It said she died in the swamp looking for him, and if you walk into the swamp today and and say we have your baby three times, she will come out of nowhere and attack you until you leave for good. And don't even try to come back after she's banished you. You might not be so lucky the second time around. And last up today in our number one spot is Sweetwater Mansion. Designed by war vet General John Brahan, this mansion was named after the nearby creek and first occupied by the general's son-in-law, Robert Patton. Under Patton's jurisdiction, the basement of the mansion served as a a civil war hospital and a county jail. And if that wasn't enough, it's said that at one point someone who lived in the mansion practiced dark magic, which thinned the veil between worlds. This would make sense considering just how many people have witnessed earth shattering apparitions that sent them running for the hills. Most notably is the casket that contains a body of a confederate soldier in one of the downstairs rooms that will suddenly disappear right in front of your eyes. It's believed that the casket is haunted by the the spirit of original owner Robert Patton, whose funeral was held at the home and who was documented having an open casket ceremony. But that's not even the scariest part. There's a room on the property that routinely locks female visitors inside. In fact, it happens so frequently that caretakers of the property have avoided entering it at all costs. And if a self-locking door and a terrifying soldier ghost don't turn you off of the property, there is also a secret room on the property with no door. The only way to enter is by a small window and it's believed that anyone who goes in will never escape. So if I were you, I'd skip this one. To Noom in Australia. So Witten
hanging out here. It must be creepy, right? Right. The island had a population of just over 5,000 at its peak in 1959. Many people living here were working out. You can see more of the town emerging from the water than ever. 25 years after it disappeared, it began to re emerge, only this time white and stripped of paint and a lot of quite possibly irreparable damage. The trees have even died after their time away from the sun, leaving ghostly, chalky looking twisted roots and leafless branches withering in the ground. Rusted Car, the village of Oradan, Suglane, was the subject of a bloody massacre. On June 10, a population of almost 50,000, Pri Piat was evacuated in a day. Now, this left hospitals, railways, homes, restaurants, shops, and amusement parks in total abandonment. Now, 30 years on from the disaster, the elements have started to claim the buildings, with grass and trees growing through them. This radiation ravaged city looks set to stand as a sad reminder of the disaster that ultimately claimed over 4,000 lives. Originally known as Forest City was once a very popular mining town in Colorado. They had about 2,000 people living there when the mines opened. However, in the early 1920s, the mining industry started to decline and slowly people packed up and left. However, it's not completely abandoned. Apparently, a couple of people still live there, but it's said that this place is haunted. In fact, it's said that it is home to some of the most paranormal activity in the state. Maybe it's a good spot for paranormal investigators, but not the best area to live in. I mean, I wouldn't want ghosts for neighbors. I mean, maybe I would if they were friendly ghosts that kept noise levels down, then sure. Moving on at number 9, we have Krakow, Italy. Krakow, Italy was founded in the 8th century. However, it now lays abandoned due to a series of destructive natural disasters. The first natural disaster occurred in 1963 when a bunch of landslides affected the area. This was a result of the city being built on a cliff 1300 feet off of the ground, and they also had some sewer and water system issues. Then in 1972, a flood struck the area and made the whole situation worse. Then in 1980, there was an earthquake that left the city completely abandoned. Now, the only people you may catch there are film crews. It's a very popular filming location. Some scenes in the film Quantum of Solace were shot there. But the area itself is considered a ticking time bomb. and it's it's surrounded by a locked gate. Making our way down the list at number 8, we have the city underwater. You aren't going to be able to visit this next city unless you have access to scuba diving gear, because this city is now completely submerged underwater. Built 1300 years ago, the city I'm referring to is Shai Chang, also referred to as Lion City, and it's located in eastern China. In 1959, the city was purposely flooded to build a hydroelectric power station. Now it's referred to as China's Atlantis. What's pretty fascinating is that although it lays about 40 meters underwater, the buildings are still in pretty good shape. The only change is instead of having human residents, it's home to tons of aquatic life. Moving on to number 7, we have Cahaba, Alabama. Cahaba in Alabama was abandoned after suffering from seasonal flooding. In 1865, Cahaba was destroyed by a flood and then abandoned. After the flood, living there became relatively impossible, so residents had no choice but to leave. But then in the 1920s, an archaeologist started to uncover and preserve some of the structures. Now it's said that the area is very haunted. In fact, it's known for a ghostly orb that can be seen floating around only to vanish into thin air. So the citizens may no longer live there, but ghosts certainly do. In our sixth spot, we have Varosha, Cyprus. In the early 70s, Varosha was one of the most popular tourist attractions in the world. That was until 1974 when Turkey invaded Cyprus. As a result, the residents there fled for their lives. Some residents have told stories of pots being left on their stoves or things still left in their ovens. It's quite sad how they were forced out of their own home and not allowed to return. Since 1974, Varosha has been abandoned and under control of the Turkish military. The whole area is now fenced off and under constant supervision. If you try to break in, 
Well, the army patrols have orders to shoot on sight. So don't even try to visit the city, it definitely will end badly. It's just such a shame because the area is beautiful. In fact, actress Elizabeth Taylor loved going there. We're now at our fifth and halfway mark with Plymouth, Montserrat. Plymouth, once the capital of Montserrat in the Caribbean, is often referred to as Pompeii of the Caribbean. Why? Well, in 1996, a volcano erupted, causing a mass evacuation. A few months later, some residents returned, but were welcomed with another eruption. On June 25th, 1997, this eruption killed 19 residents and destroyed the island's airport, trapping many others from fleeing. Eventually, Plymouth was evacuated again, but this time, no one dared to return. Everything was destroyed. In fact, 80% of the town is currently covered in ash. Pictures show homes completely buried with only their roofs sticking out. It's quite sad and scary. Moving on to number four, we have Centralia. Centralia is an abandoned town located in Pennsylvania. It was once a populated town, however, a lot of residents were forced to leave due to unsafe living conditions. This all started after a coal fire ignited underground. This fire has been burning for almost 50 years and it's predicted to continue on for another 200 years. As a result of this fire, tons of sinkholes have formed, hot smoke is released underground, and carbon monoxide has filled some residents' basements. In some parts of the town, it's said that the ground beneath them have reached up to 900 degrees Fahrenheit, which is about 400 degrees Celsius for us Canadians. Now, the US government is trying to erase any history of this city. They took away any signs directing people to this town, removed the town zip code and forced most of the residents out, except for seven residents that are happy living in their deadly town and refuse to move out. In our third spot, we have the Island of Dolls, aka the island I never want to visit. Located in Mexico City, the Island of Dolls is full of dolls hanging from trees and buildings. If that's not bad enough, these dolls have been there for so long that they are covered in dirt, cobwebs, and insects, making them look that much more terrifying. Now, you're probably wondering how this place came to be. Clearly, it's not Annabelle or Chucky's private island resort, though it could be. So back in the 1950s, a man named Don Julian started to hang dolls from trees as a way to protect himself against evil spirits. Paranormal things kept happening to him there, so he would hang dolls everywhere with the idea that they would scare the souls of the deceased. He spent more than 50 years hanging dolls. Some were found in the garbage, some were missing limbs. Did not matter, if it was a doll, it got hung up all around the island. Now it's abandoned and looks like something straight out of a horror movie. Coming in at number two, we have Wittenham, Australia. Located north northeast of Perth, Australia, Wittenham is considered one of Australia's deadliest towns. And you would think it would have to do with Australia's massive and deadly insects, but surprisingly not. In fact, it's because of its blue asbestos. In 1937, blue asbestos was discovered in the city's gorge. Years later, miners were unearthing tons of asbestos from the ground. It wasn't until 1978 that the government started pushing pushing people out of their homes. They realized how deadly it was for them to be living there. It was increasing their risk for cancer. And in some cases, people were already developing lung cancer just from living there. It would cost the town about $2.43 million to rid the town of asbestos. So instead of doing that, they just shut the town down completely. In 2006, the government turned off the power to the town and had its name removed from maps and road signs. In fact, all roads that once led to the town are now closed off. If you do choose to enter the town, you will find tons of huge warning signs advising you to turn back. And in our number one spot, we have Pripyat, Ukraine. This is probably the most famous abandoned city on the list. So Pripyat was a city in Ukraine that had a population of 49,000 individuals. However, on April 27th, 1986, all residents were forced to evacuate following the Chernobyl disaster. Pripyat was the most affected by the Chernobyl nuclear disaster since they were the closest to the power plant. They were the ones most exposed to the radioactive chemicals. A once beautiful city was 
left abandoned in just three hours. Due to the radiation, the city will be left untouched for thousands of more years until it's safe enough to return. We're starting off our trip to the Golden State with the Gates of Hell in Hacienda Heights. What is known as the Gates of Hell is this big barbed wire fence surrounding a piece of property that is rumored to have been a sanatorium back in the 40s. The story goes that this hospital had been shut down due to malpractice. And there are other stories that the building beyond this fence was the home of Satan worshippers who practiced all kinds of dark rituals on the property. As to how this rumor got started, well beyond this ominous barbed wire fence is the back entrance to a building. Those few who have managed to sneak a glimpse of it have apparently seen all sorts of pentagrams and cultish symbols drawn all over it and peeking inside the windows you can supposedly see red stains covering the inside. Now these could just be nothing more than made up stories but many people claim to have this uneasy feeling that washes over them when they pass by this gate. There has to be some reason for that barbed wire keeping people out or maybe it's there to keep something in. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. By the way, we have awesome content coming your way on the daily. All right, the notorious Bohemian Grove. Bohemian Grove is a private campground located in Monte Rio, California. It's known for hosting an annual invite-only retreat for members of the Bohemian Club, a private men's club that only allows highfalutin men from fields in politics, business, and the arts. Now, the area isn't always closed off to the public, just when this annual gathering takes place. And what goes on in these gatherings at Bohemian Grove is incredibly secretive. And there are very strict rules in place for members about maintaining this secrecy. The most famous event at Bohemian Grove is said to be the cremation of care ceremony, which is a symbolic ritual performed in front of a large owl-shaped statue. Nobody, other than the members, of course, know what this ritual entails. But you have a bunch of powerful people meeting in the middle of the woods in secret performing ceremonies. No surprise why most people on the outside find this incredibly suspect. I don't know. Let your mind go wild. Do they sacrifice a poor person every year and then drink their blood while dancing in the nude around the big owl statue? That's what I picture. I picture Wicker Man type stuff going on. Like, what needs to be so secret about a camping trip? I've never been roasting marshmallows and catching fish in the woods with my buddies and turned to them and been like, guys, this stays in the woods here. None of this gets out. All right, the hidden city under Mount Shasta. Now, unlike everything else you'll see on this list, this place is only rumored to exist. But the story behind it is pretty fascinating. According to the legend, there's said to be this hidden underground city or a network of tunnels beneath the majestic Mount Shasta in Northern California. There are a few different versions of this legend, but the gist is that there's this hidden city inhabited by an advanced and enlightened civilization. Some say they're remnants, some an ancient civilization, extraterrestrial beings, or even spiritually advanced beings known as Lumerians. Lumeria is a mythical lost continent in the Pacific, kinda in the same vein as Atlantis, and according to the legend, Lumerians found refuge in the tunnels beneath the mountain after their continent sank into the ocean. There have also been a good number of UFO sightings around Mount Shasta, and people who have claimed to actually encounter the underground city, like the prospector J.C. Brown, who claimed to discover the city back in 1904. He said he'd found a cave that sloped down 11 miles while prospecting for gold. And inside the cave, he found an entire city filled with gold and artifacts like shields and weapons, even the remains of large mummified humanoids, some of which were 10 feet tall. Brown didn't come out with his story until years later, telling a man named John C. Root about his tale. John gathered a search team, but on the day the group was supposed to meet, J.C. Brown apparently didn't show up. Not only that though, he was never seen or heard from again. So I don't know, did he actually show up? And they went down there, they found the stuff, and then they were like, we want the gold to ourselves and like took him out maybe? Who knows? Next on the list is Ano Nuevo Island. This place hasn't always been an island. It used to be connected to the mainland through a narrow strip of land that acted as a bridge, but water levels rose, eventually cutting it off. All that sits on this piece of land now are a handful of abandoned buildings and the residence, which used to be the home of a lighthouse keeper. The lighthouse is gone now, but the keeper is said to still linger in the afterlife anyway. The island is completely abandoned and off limits, now a protected wildlife preserve, home to seals and sea lions. But some say 
but on certain nights, they've seen the windows of the old lighthouse keeper's home light up as if someone or something still looms over the island, keeping watch. In the LA suburb of Downey sits a fenced off, boarded up set of homes and buildings known as the Old LA County Poor Farm. The history of this place dates back to 1887, when the LA County Board of Supervisors decided to create a facility for the homeless. They bought 124 acres of farmland near Downey, functioned as a place for them to stay but also to work. It was a working farm with buildings to house residents, offices, and even common areas. Over the years, the farm expanded to around 400 acres by 1910 and produced a variety of crops and livestock. It was a self-sustaining operation, providing food for residents and selling all the excess produce for profit. Like, what an awesome idea. We need stuff like this today. Things eventually changed, of course, though. In 1915, a new superintendent took charge. The Great Depression also brought its challenges with funding drying up and a tent city being constructed. During World War II, part of the place became an army base, and after the war, the facility evolved into a hospital, abandoning the farm aspect by the 50s. And then by the 80s, the aging hospital moved to a new facility across the street, leaving the old poor farm abandoned. It's now completely off limits to the public, surrounded by no trespassing signs and barbed wire fences. Creepy story though, in 2006, the military came to the area for a training exercise and Marines stumbled upon a freezer containing tons of mummified body parts, likely from the hospital, but that's still really creepy. The Point Sur Lighthouse is surrounded by ghostly tales. It was constructed in 1889, helping to navigate vessels along the Big Sur coastline. One tale about this place is that the original lighthouse keeper continues to watch over the tower till this day. Future keepers have had the creepy experience of being all alone in the tower at night, only to hear labored footsteps ascending the stairs and the sounds of huffs and puffs coming from the stairs. But when they've called out to ask who's there or to go and look, the stairway is completely empty. There are also stories about a woman in a vintage dress wandering near the lighthouse, and some say she's the spirit of one who died in a shipwreck. Next on the list is the Lincoln Heights Jail. This was a pretty notorious jail. Big names like Al Capone used to be housed here. The jail has been around since 1931. It was originally constructed to hold about 625 prisoners, but by the 50s it was packing in about 2,800 folks. You can only imagine what the conditions were like in that place. And in the 50s and 60s, when LA was cracking down on LGBT activity, the place became known for something else. Cops were going after queer individuals, making arrests, and the prison had its own separate wing just for these prisoners. In 1965, the city decided to shut the facility down. It sat empty for ages with people tossing around ideas for renovations, a trade school, a rooftop garden. In 1979, the Bilingual Foundation for the Arts moved in, but by 2014, it was abandoned yet again. Fast forward to 2017, the city wanted ideas to revive the place. The Lincoln Property Company and 15 Group got the nod to turn it into a Lincoln Heights Maker's District. Public market, amphitheater, all that kind of jazz, but the place ended up being really tough to renovate. It was full of hazardous material, decay, and getting the place up to current environmental standards was tough. So the project was ultimately abandoned, and the place still sits empty to this day. Next up, we have the Sunken City. This spot is is completely off limits to the public, although you probably wouldn't think it with how many people fart around in the place. The sunken city is located in San Pedro and got its name in 1929 when a landslide caused a part of the coastline to plunge into the ocean. This left behind this series of concrete foundations, streets, and sidewalks that now sit below the cliffs. The area became popular for how eerie and surreal the landscape is. Even though it's been technically closed off to the public since 87, because of safety concerns, people were climbing the unstable cliffs and it became a liability. They're not supposed to go wandering around there and the city has to put up fences and signs to make sure everyone gets the message. Trespassing can result in fines or even arrests, but people continue to sneak in. When I say people, I mean like young people. Let's be real. It looks beautiful though. There's palm trees, really cool looking graffiti. I get why people would want to check it out, but apparently it can be pretty dangerous. Forget the fines. People often get mugged here or worse. Let's talk about Murphy Ranch, sitting in the hills near Los Angeles. So back in the 30s, a couple with some pretty unconventional ideas decided to build a self-sufficient compound there. And by unconventional ideas, 
I mean, they were incredibly anti-Semitic. They thought the world was headed for some major chaos, and seeing as World War II was looming, kind of was, so they built this compound, which ended up becoming something of a base for American Third Reich sympathizers during the Second World War. The compound had living quarters, a power station, and even a water storage system. It was a haven for them, and uh, other like-minded pricks. But the US government got wind of it and shut it down in 1941, the day after the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. The remains of Murphy Ranch now sit completely abandoned and completely off limits. Old dilapidated buildings and graffiti covered walls are all that remain. Yes, graffiti, people still do sneak in. Next on the list we have Alcatraz. This is one of the most notorious former prisons in the entire world. The amount of stories about this place is damn near endless, and it's said that some of the former prisoners still linger within the building till this day. Back in the 1850s, it started as a military setup, housing soldiers, but then in 1934, it switched gears and became a high security prison, holding big name crooks like Al Capone and George Machine Gun Kelly. Life on Alcatraz was no joke for inmates. They faced solitary confinement, hard labor, and punishment was incredibly tough. On top of that, the place was said to be this impossible area to escape, being out in the middle of nowhere, surrounded by ice-cold water. Oddly enough, though, there were actually multiple escape attempts here, a whopping 14 to be exact. The most famous attempt was in 1962 when Frank Morris and the Anglin brothers disappeared into thin air. Some say they actually made it to shore, started new lives in secret, but others think they drowned in the frigid water. Others who tried weren't as lucky guards shot some or just caught him before they even got that far. Ami, Japan. This town in Fukushima Prefecture once housed 20,000 residents, but in one night, in March of 2011, the most destructive earthquake in Japanese history hit off the coast. This caused a massive tsunami that hit a nearby power plant. After three meltdowns and widespread nuclear fallout, the residents were forced to evacuate. The town was completely abandoned for a year, until April of 2012, when and residents were allowed to slowly make their way back in, but only in two designated zones. Zone 3 was completely off limits and still remains so to this very day. There have been many attempts to try and rebuild the town into what it once was. Rents have been reduced. There's even been plans to build a Pokemon themed theme park, but most uh, people just don't want to go anywhere near the place based on the radioactive contamination, which uh, is understandable. Number 9. Kantubek, Uzbekistan. This abandoned town sits on Vazrozdanya Island and was abandoned in 1992 after the dissolution of the Soviet Union. This town was built to house about 1,500 people. Most of its residents were scientists working at a top secret USSR biological weapons testing site. This place became an absolute nightmare following a couple, you know, little accidents that left a number of people infected with smallpox. After a field tests went wrong. Uh, two people ended up dying. Then about a year later, two fishermen were found dead, likely from the bubonic plague that had leaked out of the testing facility. Then antelopes started killing over and dying. Uh, dead fish were being hauled out of the sea in big nets. Uh, the island became a dumping ground for anthrax in the 80s until the lab was finally closed down, with the town becoming deserted by 1992. Apparently there's plans to turn the area into a national park. I I would not go anywhere near this place. In 2002, there was a US-led expedition to neutralize the anthrax, because uh, they were scared that like possible bad people were going to try and get their hands on it. Uh, even still though, I don't know, just let bygones be bygones. It, radioactive, it's, is it ever fully gone? You know? And at number eight, we have Craco, Italy. Man, this place looks beautiful. Just wanted to start by saying that. There's definitely an eeriness with abandoned towns, but this one has such a majestic quality about it. It doesn't look all depressing and gray like an abandoned city you'd see in Russia or something. So, Krako is a historic hilltop town located in the Basilicata region of southern Italy. Its history dates back to the 8th century when it was founded by the Greeks. The town prospered during the medieval period when its economy based on agriculture and craftsmanship, but in the 20th century, Krako faced a number of issues. In 1963, a landslide forced many residents to abandon their homes and relocate to a nearby 
Valley. There were also earthquakes in 1972 and 1980, which further damaged the town's infrastructure, making it basically uninhabitable. The Italian government declared Craco a ghost town, and the remaining residents were forced to leave due to safety concerns. Today, the town stands as this hauntingly beautiful shell of what it once was. The buildings are crumbling, the streets are empty, at least when tourists aren't visiting. The town's also been used for a filming location for a number of movies, most notably Quantum of Solace. Next on the list is Wittenoom, Australia. This is just a very sad story. So, this town was built in 1947 in Pilbara, Western Australia, housed 20,000 residents, and was bustling with life at one point. They had a movie theater, two schools, a hotel. The parents of most of the families living there, uh, though, worked in the nearby Blue Asbestos Mine. This was a time where people didn't know how harmful asbestos was. By the mid-60s, though, it became a known thing, and the mine was shut down, and a lot of residents up and left. The thing is, they'd already been exposed to it for so long, over 2,000 of these former residents would go on to die of asbestos-related illnesses. The area has now become known as Australia's Chernobyl. Number six, Pyramiden. Pyramiden in Svalbard, Norway, was once a thriving Soviet coal mining settlement, established in 1910 by Sweden. It was later sold to the Soviet Union in 1927. The town's name translates to the Pyramid in various languages, named after the pyramid-shaped mountain nearby. During its peak, Pyramiden housed a significant population. The town's economy relied heavily on coal mining, and it continued to operate under Soviet management until the early 90s. But in 98, Pyramiden was abruptly abandoned when mining ceased. The residents left behind buildings, possessions, and remnants of this once vibrant community. And today, Pyramiden stands frozen in time as a ghost town. And the harsh Arctic climate has preserved the town remarkably well. Buildings remain standing, showcasing this Soviet-era architecture and interiors, and the town's infrastructure, including the swimming pool, school, cultural center, still eerily intact. And at number five, Bannock, Montana. This abandoned town in Beaverhead County, Montana, was founded in 1862 after the discovery of gold in Grasshopper Creek. It quickly became a booming mining town, attracting thousands of prospectors and settlers seeking fortune in the gold fields. With the prospect of wealth, though, came a ton of violence and lawlessness. In 1863, the infamous Plummer Gang, led by Henry Plummer, became the town's sheriff, secretly organizing a gang of outlaws who terrorized the area. There were a series of robberies, stagecoach holdups, violent deaths happened as a result. The citizens, fed up with this rampant crime, formed the Vigilance Committee, which eventually captured and hanged over 20 members of this gang, including Plummer, in a single night. Shootouts, barroom brawls, other violent incidents it was just happening all the time here back in the day. It was your classic Wild West town. But as the gold reserves dwindled and new mining opportunities came about in other places, the town's population started to decline. Today, Bannock stands as this well-preserved ghost town with over 60 historic structures remaining, including houses, saloons, and a schoolhouse. Because of its violent history, though, some visitors and locals believe the place to be haunted. Numerous ghost stories and paranormal encounters have been reported over the years. Next on the list, we have Frisco in Beaver County, Utah. This was a mining town that boomed in the late 19th century. Established in the 1870s, it was named after the San Francisco Mountains. The miners extracted silver, lead, and zinc from nearby mines. During its heyday, Frisco was notorious for its lawlessness and violence. The town earned a reputation as one of the wildest mining camps in the West. Shootouts, brawls, and other violent things were common. At one point, multiple men would die violently on a nightly basis. I've heard up to 12, which is insane. I don't know if that's true. 12 a night? How would you even have people left after like a month? But anyway, but as the mines were depleted, and economic opportunities started to die down, the town's population began to decline. By the 1920s, the place was mostly abandoned. It's now a complete ghost town with abandoned structures, crumbling homes, and decaying industrial facilities. 
Number 3. Centralia, Pennsylvania. Centralia used to be a lively, you guessed it, coal mining town in Columbia County. Back in the mid 1800s, coal mining really kicked off and the town prospered through the late 19th and early 20th centuries, but trouble began in 1962 when a fire started in the coal mines beneath the town. Nobody knows exactly how it began, but it's believed to have started in a landfill, an abandoned strip mine pit. Efforts to put out the fire failed and it kept burning underground. By the 80s, it became clear the situation was just dire. Carbon monoxide was seeping from the fire. The government stepped in and in 84, a law was passed to move Centralia's residents. Most buildings were torn down and people were relocated to nearby towns. Even today though, like smoke and toxic gases are, continue to rise from the ground. It, it's very apocalyptic looking. In its second place, we have St. Elmo, Colorado. St. Elmo is a ghost town located in Chaffee County, Colorado. Founded in the late 1800s, St. Elmo was once a thriving mining town, mostly focusing on gold and silver mining. There was a general store, hotels, saloons. Over the years, as mining activities started to die down, residents left St. Elmo, and by the 1920s, the town became mostly abandoned. But today, many of its original buildings still stand. This place is a ghost town in more ways than one though. Annabelle Stark, also known as Dirty Annie, was, was uh, one of the last residents of the town. She lived there with her brother Tony Stark, who suffered from mental health issues. As the town started to empty, Annabelle and Tony were among the few who still remained, and Tony's mental state deteriorated further due to the isolation and lack of social interaction. He was often seen walking the streets, muttering to himself. Annabelle, caring for her brother, lived a reclusive life in their decaying family home, Dirty Annie Stark became something of a local legend known for her resilience and determination to stay in St. Elmo despite its abandonment. Some reports suggest that Annabelle and Tony were eventually the very last two residents of the town, refusing to leave even when most of the buildings around them were completely empty. Today, this ghost town is said to be haunted by the ghost of Dirty Annie still roaming the empty streets at night as it's ghostly protector. And finally, we have Ardour sur Glane in France. The 10th of June, 1944 was a dark day for the residents of this quiet farming village. SS Major General Heinz Bernhard sent his troops in the Waffen SS Panzer Division to the village in retaliation against French resistance activity in the area. They wanted to send a message, so they destroyed the entire village and pretty much everyone in it. Even people just passing by the area were dragged into the massacre. In the end, only six people managed to escape. These victims were just civilians, mostly being women and children. People were taken to barns where they were down with machine guns. Others were loaded into a church which was set on fire. Anyone attempting to escape through the windows were down. It was about as nightmarish as it gets. And today, what remains of the village still stands, left exactly as it was after the massacre. A haunting reminder of the atrocities that took place on that day. It's been called the most haunted town in America. It's still open for guests. Really? Yes. All right, we're starting off the list with Inunaki Village. Uh, if you want a truly evil town, uh, this is it. Inunaki is said to be this hidden village in a forest in Fukuoka Prefecture. There are only a small handful of residents in Ununaki, and they're not friendly. These are people who choose to go against the principles of Japanese culture. Anyone who's unfortunate enough to find themselves even just in the vicinity of Inunaki may be dragged in only to be met with the violent, sadistic people who live there. One story goes that in the early 70s, a couple's car broke down. They ventured further up the forest hoping to find help, but they came across a small empty town. It looked totally abandoned. Then out of one of the homes stepped this disheveled, crazy-eyed old man who told the couple they were in the village of Inunaki. Then he chopped them up with a sickle. So yes, Inunaki village 
is an urban legend, but with every urban legend, there is a nugget of truth. And the legend of Inunaki Village really started with the old Inunaki Tunnel. This tunnel, built in 1949, has a history so dark that it's now completely sealed off. A number of violent crimes and deaths have happened at the tunnel, to the point where stories began to spread that there was this evil village beyond it. And even though it's all sealed off now, there are also plenty of stories of the place being being very, very haunted. Tucked away and forgotten by time, Ikigo Middlegate has quite the story to tell, straddling a line between a grim past and its very current eerie persona. A spot that once echoed with the despair of World War II concentration camps has now transformed into this intriguing, albeit slightly spooky, abandoned site. Located in a US Navy housing area campground in Zushi City, the middle gate to this campground is said to have been a Japanese ammunition depot, but also a place where prisoners of war were held and executed or worked to death. Guards of the Middle Gate have reported seeing legless Japanese soldiers in World War II era uniforms, as well as hearing the classic disembodied voices and footsteps. It's always the footsteps that get me. I don't like it. This history is certainly grim enough to make this place one that has countless tales of hauntings and ghostly visits, but the history of this area does not stop here. In fact, it is said that the area surrounding Aikigo also happens to be the resting place of around 50 yagura, or ancient burial tombs. The tombs were built into the sides of cliffs and date all the way back to the 16th and 17th centuries. Legend also has it that this area was a battlefield for groups of samurai in the 14th century where many people lost their heads, all right? All in all, this makes a lot of sense why this place has countless terrifying stories surrounding it. A bunch of nearly headless nicks walking around. Milady. Next on the list we have Nichitsu, which is usually referred to as Nichitsu Ghost Town. And that's not just because it's completely abandoned either. Apparently you can still find some ghostly residents lingering around this place. Nichitsu was a tin mining town, the workers and their families had to live on site because it's a pretty good clip away from surrounding cities. At some time in the 80s though, everyone up and left, and it's not entirely known why. With most mining towns, there's, there's always a possibility that the mines just dry up. Usually there's an economic factor, but whatever the reason was, the ghost town is said to be haunted. There's a doctor's office in the abandoned hospital that still has the remains of human organs. There's also a jar with a human brain that was there for a while, but someone stole that. Anyway, the place looks like it would be a pretty cool area to explore. Let's take a jaunt into the eerie folds of Japan's past, right into the heart of Orian Buchi. All right, I tried to look it up. It's not as easy to look up as you think it is, okay? So just politely let me know how to pronounce it in the comments if I got it wrong. Long, keyword being polite. This place isn't your average historical site. It's steeped in tales of sorrow and the supernatural. Here, the air is thick with the legend of courtesans whose lives took a tragic turn, leaving behind a legacy that's as somber as it is mysterious. The legends behind this place go back to the Warring States period. This was a period between the 15th and 16th century where there were almost constant civil wars and upheavals seen in Japan. During this time, this site had a gold mine. Of course, this meant that quite a few people were in the area because of this mine, and there were also courtesans who came here in order to give their services to the men working the mine. Unfortunately, in an attempt to keep the secret of the gold from getting out, it is said that those working the mines took the lives of the 55 courtesans in the area. Since this dark moment in history, there have been countless haunting tales from this area. It is said that the hauntings most often come at night, and people have expressed hearing mostly the screams and cries of the women who are said to haunt the area. So, are you up for a visit? This place sounds pretty horrifying. James, are you gonna go there? <laughs> yeah, Next on the list we have Yokai Village. This small village in the Tokushima prefecture has a history full of tales of yokai. If you don't know what yokai are, they're basically the demons and spirits of Japanese folklore. This village 
once had a good number of residents, about 15,000, but the story goes that villagers started having encounters with what they could only describe as yokai, and at some point in the 50s, a ton of people just packed their bags and started leaving town because there were demons about, which is understandable. This village was the birthplace of a lot of yokai legends, including the Kanokai Jiji, which is a type of yokai resembling a short old man who is constantly weeping. And when passersby try to comfort what looks like a small crying old man, it then latches onto them, and with the victim unable to break free from this small old man's grasp, because he's not an old man, he's a demon, the yokai then increases its weight until the poor person is just crushed to death. They've started embracing the spirits and demons said to reside there, and now hold yokai festivals and have put up tons of yokai statues. It looks like a really cool place. Just a hop, skip, and a jump away from the tranquil sanctity of Nikos Tashugo Shrine, there lies an altogether different realm. A ghostly echo of Americana right in the heart of Japan. Welcome to the Western Village, a theme park that once throbbed with the sounds of cowboy boots and saloon piano, inspired by the wild frontiers of classic westerns and the dystopian allure of Westworld. Imagine stepping into 1973, the year this very peculiar park sprang to life, a place where the Wild West met the Far East, brimming with gunslingers, saloons, and a replica of Mount Rushmore. But fast forward to 2007 and the tumbleweeds began to roll. The park closed its doors, leaving behind a tableau frozen in time, an eerie tableau that whispers tales of yesteryear to those who dare to visit. Today, the Western Village stands as a hauntingly beautiful paradox, a place where time seems to stand still amidst the decay. Urban explorers, those modern-day adventurers, flock here, drawn by the irresistible allure of its desolation and the uncanny presence of its robotic inhabitants. And we're heading back to Tokushima Prefecture once again to discuss Nagoro. So this remote village has had a steadily declining population over the years. There were never a ton of residents, but more and more people started leaving to look for better employment opportunities. The old folks passed away, that's just what they do, and by 2019 the village that at one time had 300 plus people, now only had about 27. So the place is basically a ghost town, but unlike other abandoned towns you'll come across, this one has become pretty well known for all the life-size dolls scattered throughout the streets and buildings. Tsukimi Ayano, a woman who had left the village when she was young and then came back about 20 years ago to care for her father, decided she wanted to make the place feel more lively. So she started creating all these dolls. And today, there are over 350 dolls placed throughout the village. Definitely gives the place a strange vibe. On one hand, there's this tranquil beauty to it, just quiet and pleasant. But on the other hand, there is an underlying sadness about it, kind of like uh, in I Am Legend, where Will Smith puts up a bunch of mannequins and he starts yelling at them because they won't respond to him. That is a sad scene. What about the Osari Zawa mine? <laughs> <laughs> Tucked away in the verdant depths of the Akita prefecture lies this ghostly vestige of industrial ambition. Once a thriving hub of copper extraction, this mine's veins pulsed with the lifeblood of progress until the mid 20th century. Yet, all mines have their final days, and for Osari Zawa, the echoes of activity have long since faded into an eerie silence. Now, imagine wandering through the abandoned town that once buzzed with the hopes and hard work of its inhabitants. Streets where laughter and chatter once filled the air are now corridors of quiet, bordered by the crumbling relics of homes and communal spaces. There's the desolate school, standing forlorn, its empty classrooms whispering tales of generations who learned and played within its walls, now surrendered to the relentless march of nature. But it's not just about what's gone, it's about what's left behind. The mine and its ghost town are shrouded in mystery that tugs at the curious and the brave. What stories are etched into the fading walls? What secrets do these silent shafts hold? Next on the list is Nara Dreamland. Now, unfortunately, this place 
has now been demolished, but for a long time it sat completely abandoned, and urban explorers would share some rather creepy stories about the place, but I'll get to that in a minute. So Nara Dreamland was a theme park in Nara, the capital city of Nara Prefecture. It opened in 1961 and was around for years before finally closing in 2006. It couldn't afford to stay open because of low attendance. The place was huge, pretty much the size of a small village, and it just sat there out of use for like 10 years. There's something I find so especially eerie and sad about abandoned theme parks. I mean, these are places that are literally built to be filled with people. Everything is made to be an overload to the senses. Larger than life cartoony statues are all over the place. The signs are all vibrant and colorful. You're supposed to walk through a theme park hearing laughter and screaming and the sounds of large rides zipping along the tracks. So when these places are empty and worn down, left for nature to slowly creep in and reclaim them. It's just the polar opposite of what the place was originally intended for, and I think that just unsettles us. And it doesn't help that urban explorers would claim to hear strange sounds near the park's boats or see strange shadowy figures poking out of corners. Dive with me into the eerie silence of Yodo Harbor, where whispers of the past mingle with the murmurs of rebuilding. A once thriving port bustling with life, suddenly silenced by nature's wrath in 2011. The Tohoku earthquake and tsunami didn't just shake the ground, they shook the very soul of this place, leaving behind a ghost town where echoes of lost lives linger in the air. Now, when you stroll through Yodo Harbor, you're walking a tightrope between two worlds, the tangible buzz of reconstruction and the shadowy quiet of areas frozen in time. These neglected corners, untouched and forsaken, aren't just empty. They're charged with the stories of what was. It's as if the town itself is caught in a haunting limbo, struggling to whisper its secrets to those who dare to listen. So if you're drawn to places where history and mystery intertwine, where every stone and silent building might hold a hidden narrative, then Yodo Harbor beckons. It's a testament to the unpredictable nature of creation and destruction, and a haunting reminder that even in our absence, stories endure waiting to be unearthed. Starting off our list today, we have the Texas Killing Fields. As the name implies, people died there. At least 30, but possibly more. This stretch of land that covers 25 acres is located just outside side of Texas City. It is vast, barren, vacant, and apparently the perfect place to hide a body. Since the 1930s, many young women have gone missing in the area surrounding the fields. And while some remain missing to this day, many of the women's bodies have been found discarded in said fields. And the first discovery was made in 1984. A dog carried something its owner originally thought was a ball out of the field, but it turned out to be a human skull and after that the floodgates opened. Clyde Edwin Hendrick, John Robert King, Peter Zwarst, Kevin Edinson, Smith, and William Lewis Reese were all arrested and imprisoned for separate killings except for King and Zwarst who had worked together, meaning that only a total of four killings have been solved to date. The killers of the remaining victims as well as the remaining victims' identities remain unsolved to this day. Next up we've got Alton Bridge, also known as Goatman Bridge, located between the Texas cities of Denton and Copper Canyon. The bridge was used from the 1930s all the way up to 2001 when it was closed for vehicle traffic. So yes, it's abandoned, but how has it earned itself a spot on our list today? Well, it's got a pretty dark past, which I will tell you about now. The legend goes that in August of 1938, a successful goat breeder who went by the name of Goatman, but whose real name was Oscar Washburn, hung a sign up on the bridge that read, This Way to the Goatman, which apparently severely pissed off a local radical hate group that I can't say the name of here on YouTube, but they wore white pointed hoods and they were terrible. Probably know who I'm talking about. Well, one of the members of that group took Washburn by force. They brought him to the Elton Bridge and ended his life. They threw him over the side of the bridge, but when they looked down to catch a glimpse of his body, he was nowhere to be found. Enraged, the group made their way to his home and killed his entire family. Since this alleged incident, many people have claimed on many separate occasions to have seen the ghost of Oscar Washburn leading his flock across the bridge in the middle of the night. Next up, we have the Baker Hotel 
in Mineral Wells, Texas, which is probably one of the most famously abandoned places in the state, according to the internet. Although it's no longer abandoned today, actually it's now a health spa, it was abandoned between the years of 1972 and 2019. The hotel opened its doors in 1929, welcoming people from all over who were attracted to this so-called crazy water with healing powers found in the town of Mineral Wells. Many spirits are said to haunt the hotel, including T.D. Baker, who died in his room of unknown causes after his mistress flung herself from a seventh floor window. Another apparition who calls the hotel home is a bellhop who was cut in half during an elevator accident back in the 1950s. If you already have a fear of elevators, I'm so sorry, that's super gross. Another is a young man who died of leukemia while staying at the hotel. Reports of red lipstick smears appearing out of nowhere, broken glass, windows opening and shutting on their own, along with legitimate ghost sightings, continue to fascinate visitors of the area and the hotel, both in its abandoned and reopened opened state. Next up we have Stort Mansion, located in Galveston Island, Texas. This area has a rough history. Before the grounds became the resting place of the Stort Mansion, they had been the campsite of the Karankawa tribe, who were perhaps most well known for eating human flesh. The tribe was also killed on the land by John Lafitte's pirate colony in a gruesome battle. And if that's not bad enough, legend says that the father of the Stort family went mad and killed his wife and sons, and then allegedly buried them all inside the walls of the mansion before taking his own life shortly thereafter. Many people who visit the now abandoned attraction claim to see the ghosts of the Karankawa peoples along with the ghosts of deceased pirates, as well as a voodoo priestess who many believe was a prisoner of the pirate colony, and of course, the ghosts of the Storts who are said to walk the halls regretfully and mournfully. Next up at our halfway point today, we have the USS Lexington, an Essex-class aircraft carrier, say that five times fast, which during the Second World War participated in almost every major operation in the Pacific Theater, which was kind of the Asia-Pacific Wars, and it spent a total of 21 months in combat. As you can imagine, the massive 872-foot vessel has seen a lot of action in its day, but on its final day at sea, the vessel was hit by two torpedoes in its hull and it began to sink. 216 crewmen were killed and 2,735 were evacuated. In true naval fashion, the captain Felix Stump was the last to disembark the vessel. He did survive, but died of cancer many years later. Thanks to fundraising efforts, the abandoned ship was eventually retrieved from the ocean floor and converted into a museum which has been referred to as the most haunted in America. It said that Anyone who enters the ship will feel the presence of those who died on board. Next on our list, we have the old Yorktown Memorial Hospital, which opened in 1951 and was abandoned in 1990, but eventually reopened many years later as a tourist attraction, meaning you can visit it if you want. While this is the case, many people believe that the hospital was never truly vacant, as even after its closure, it was home to the many ghosts that continue to roam its halls. In fact, the attraction is so haunted, it actually appeared numerous times on the reality television show Ghost Adventures. If you guys watch that, I don't know, let me know in the comments, I've never seen it. Perhaps the most famous story that outlines the horrors of the hospital would have to be the one detailing the incompetence of Dr. Leon Norwierski, who slipped a patient's throat while performing a procedure on their neck. Whether or not this was an accident is highly debated. Was he incompetent or was he malicious? I don't know. I always like to think incompetence, but... The ghost of the deceased patient is said to vengefully roam the halls of the former hospital. And the hospital is also home to a gaggle of ghost nuns who are super strict, and they punish those wearing unacceptable hospital clothing and sporting tattoos by pushing, scratching, or forcing them out of the building. Next up, we have... Presido Nuestra Señora de Loretta de Bahia, a fort whose name I will not be attempting to pronounce again, that was constructed in Texas by the Spanish army in 1747. And it's the site of the Goliad event, which took place during the Texas Revolution and resulted in the deaths of somewhere between 425 to 445 people. Those who died were Texian army soldiers, prisoners of war to the Mexican army. The hundreds of men were killed with projectiles, piled up, and set on fire. It's a 
pretty dark past, so it probably comes as no surprise that the area is obviously super haunted. But what might shock you is the fact that it isn't said to be haunted by any of the men, but rather a woman who lost her lover during the gruesome event. She wanders the grounds of the fort, helplessly searching the graves for a name that can't be found. Many who visit the grounds have also reported hearing cannon fire banging on the walls and the strong smell of BLOOD near the fort chapel's courtyard. I'm sorry you guys, I can't say these words on here. Next up, we have a name I can definitely pronounce, Donkey Lady Bridge. We had Goatman and now we've got Donkey Lady. It's located 30 miles southwest of San Antonio and the bridge is said to be the final resting place of a woman who was raised by donkeys after being abandoned by her parents. In 2006, the San Antonio Express released an article recounting her story. It appears as though while out one day, one of the woman's donkeys bit a man's son. The father was furious and later ambushed the woman and her donkey on the bridge, causing her to fall in the river and drowned. Many people have said that if you drive to the bridge today, turn off your car engine, you'll hear the cries of the woman and her donkey. If you have tried it, if you do try it, let me know. Starting off our top two, we have the Toya Ghost Town. At its peak in 1910, the town was home to a whopping 1,052 people. Not that much. But today, the number has dwindled down to just 57. This is possibly due to the 2004 tornado that devastated the town, leaving the majority of the homes and the volunteer fire department abandoned. While this might sound pretty basic, those who live in the town today tell of something pretty extraordinary. Dark, but extraordinary. Locals believe that the town is occupied by entities, young people, with pitch black eyes that go around the town at night, terrorizing its residents, knocking on doors and staring through windows, instilling fear into whoever might meet their gaze. It has been said that this is the true reason for the town's near total abandonment back in the early 2000s, but of course, I wanna know what you think. And finally, to finish off our list today, we have the former Williamson County Jail circa 1888. The jail was home to some of Texas's most notorious criminals, including Henry Lee Lucas, who claims to have taken the life of 35 people in the year 1982. It's a busy guy if he did it in just one year. The crime rate at the time was out of control, so much so that the jail became quickly overcrowded. So overcrowded, in fact, that it became incredibly easy for inmates to slip out of the prison undetected, only to continue their reign of terror on the Williamson County people. Luckily for the locals, the majority of escaped convicts were recaptured, unlucky for the convicts, as the majority of them were sentenced to death by lethal injection, electric chair and the old rope and tree. But you guys know by now, I can't say that word on here. The jail was abandoned in 1971, but it later reopened as county offices. And it has been told that the deceased inmates now haunt the building, throwing binders and books from shelves and lunches off of desks. It seems like they're still kind of holding a bit of a grudge against the members of state. If you're feeling a bit disappointed at the fact that no, it's technically no longer abandoned, it once was though, so that's why it's on this list, I will give give you some solace in knowing that the building is actually open for public tours during the fall season, so do with that what you will. Castleton, I have always wanted to go to a ghost town. I think it would be like really eerie, fun at the same time, and the town of West Castleton on Lake Bommelsine has long been abandoned. What once used to be a busy, bustling industrial town has been empty since the 1930s, and there are many who claim that the area area is teeming with ghostly apparitions. There is one tale about two men who once took their boat out to visit a tavern in town but were never seen from again. The only remnants of the men was their empty rowboat found floating alone in Lake Bamosin following day. Some say that on some nights when the moon is full to have seen an empty semi-translucent rowboat silently making its way across the water towards the abandoned town on the other side of the lake. If you're liking the uh, channel, guys, don't forget to comment and subscribe. It really helps us out more than you probably know. All right. On to number nine. At number nine, we have Montpellier Cemetery, more specifically the Black Agnes statue. Sitting atop the grave of John Hubbard, a notorious crook in the late 1800s who swindled his way into gaining his aunt's inheritance, which was meant to go to the city, he received his aunt's estate to the frustration of the city leaders, but died of liver cancer just a few years later. This statue is pretty famous for being one of the most haunted items in the state of Vermont and just looking at it doesn't really surprise me much. I don't really believe in curses myself. I've never been cursed, at least that I know of, 
and I've never successfully cursed anyone else, though I have tried on a number of occasions. But looking at a statue like this, I could see why people would feel a little uneasy around it, especially upon learning that the statue is meant to be the personification of death itself, the Greek god Thanatos. It is said that if you sit on the statue's lap, you'll be met with misfortune, and if you dare sit upon it on a full moon at midnight, you will die within a week. Next on the list, we have the Brattleboro Retreat Tower. This beautiful gothic tower sits on the grounds of Brattleboro Retreat, which is a mental health facility that still operates today, but was originally built as an asylum in 1834. This particular tower was constructed between 1887 and 1894 by patients of the asylum, with doctors believing they would benefit from physical labor, and the tower still remains, now standing abandoned. That tower has a bit of a dark history History, though there were said to be multiple cases of patients having taken their lives from the top of the tower and in the 1920s and 30s there were multiple shootings surrounding the tower that finally led to its entrance being boarded up in 1938. Those who visit the structure today claim to feel an eerie presence even reporting having seen ghostly apparitions plummeting from the top. If I ever find myself in the area uh, I'd love to check it out. Aside from the ghost stuff I, I just be really cool to hang out by this gothic tower in the middle of a forest. Glastonbury Mountain, located in Bennington County's Green Mountain National Forest, has been the breeding ground for all sorts of paranormal activity. If you decide to traverse the mountain, you just might happen across a Sasquatch or, or spot a UFO in the sky. There's even an Algonquin legend about a stone that devours people. And if all that isn't enough, to pique your interest, the area is also said to be cursed. Five hikers known to have gone missing in the area between 1945 to 1950. Only one body was ever found and the cause of death was never determined. There have also been uh, so, so many strange occurrences in the area. It's often referred to as the Bennington Triangle, like the Bermuda Triangle. See, you got it. Number six, the Dutton House in Shelburne Museum. Shelburne Museum uh, is a collection of various historical buildings, most of which have been moved to the property from other locations. And one of these structures is the Dutton House. The home was built by the Dutton family in Cavendish, Vermont in 1781. And 11 people are thought to have died in the home and uh, it was left abandoned for decades before being moved to the museum in 1950. Staff say they've seen some pretty strange things things in there, like the sound of a little girl crying, which isn't a sight, that's a, something you hear, James. Anyway, uh, but they've also seen ghostly faces in windows. Some visitors claim they've heard eerie whispers in the halls and felt an icy chill running down their spines. And there have been sightings of a transparent figure roaming the house at night. They say it's the ghost of the original owner who passed away. Some folks reckon he and his family are still lingering around. They're refusing to leave the home. Some staff are so creeped out by the place that they just refuse to go in inside it entirely. Next we have Green Mountain Inn. This inn is said to be haunted by one primary apparition, that being Boots Berry, located in Stowe. This beautiful inn, built back in 1833, pretty picturesque. Honestly, if I ever take a trip to Stowe, this is where I want to stay. But you may find yourself rooming with an extra guest. Boots Berry was said to have been born in the hotel, the son of two employees. As he grew up, he developed a, a drinking problem, though, and was eventually kicked out of the inn. Landed himself in a prison in New Orleans. Orleans, but soon returned to Stowe where he supposedly fell to his death off the roof of the Green Mountain Inn, where he apparently loved to uh, tap dance. So some say on some nights they can hear the sounds of his tap dancing feet on the roof. Others claim to have actually seen a full-bodied apparition of Boots making his way down the corridors of the inn. Number four, Norwich University. Some dark things are said to have happened in the walls of this prestigious institution with its gorgeous campus nestled among the rolling hills and has a reputation of being haunted. There's a boarded up dorm room where a long time ago, two students were said to have taken their lives. Students and staff have reported hearing strange noises and, and voices emanating from the supposedly empty room. Then you have Chaplin Hall, the former library where 
where books were said to fly and float off the shelves. Nowadays, residents report seeing strange figures roaming the hallway. You also have two other areas of the school that are supposedly plagued by paranormal activity, Ranson and Hawkins Hall. Many students have reported waking up, unable to move or breathe, feeling like something is sitting on their chest. Sleep paralysis, it can be pretty unsettling, but I doubt there's anything paranormal going on there, especially for stressed out university students. But hey, I, I guess you never really truly know. Next up, we have Marble Inn, located in Fairhaven, Vermont. This inn is said to have a few different spirits that reside within the building. It was built in 1867, and one of the previous owners apparently passed away in the tea room, and apparently he was pretty upset about it too, because now he, as well as a couple other ghosts, supposedly haunt the place. Many guests have reported waking up to see the figure of a man in a gray suit standing at the foot of their bed. There was also an instance where a repair Herman was working on the basement and suddenly spotted a woman standing behind him, but she just remained silent before walking into another room. Perriman was obviously pretty confused, but he followed the woman into the room. When he entered it, there was nobody there. Classic ghost story. Just an empty, dark room. I wonder what the rest of this workday was like after that. How do you just go back to what you were doing after experiencing something like that? Like, if I saw a ghost, it would just change everything for me. Oh. Ghosts, I guess they just exist now. Well, that completely changes my entire outlook on life. What happens after death? What is reality? Am I just am I just hallucinating things now? Am I someone who hallucinates? What is going on? Anyway, these pipes, they're not gonna fix themselves. Back to work. Number two, the Bowman House, aka Laurel Hall, regarded as one of the most haunted places in Vermont. The first owner of the home, John Bowman, is buried at, in a mausoleum on the property, along with the rest of his family, each of whom died tragically. Locals swear they've seen shadowy figures moving about the rooms and strange noises echo through the halls at night. Some say they hear the disembodied cry of a baby, which would really freak and irk me out, quite frankly. I can't stand babies crying in public as it is. Uh, they seem to show up everywhere I go for some reason. So last thing I need in my life is a wailing ghost baby now. Some people who visit the home even claim to have seen the ghostly figure of Mrs. Bowman standing at the top of the stairs. There are whispers of disembodied voices calling out in despair and ghostly stuff going on. Some folks claim they've even witnessed objects moving on their own. Basically, some people think it's haunted is, is what I'm getting out here. Number one, we have Goldbrook Bridge, aka Emily's Bridge. Emily's Bridge in Vermont is infamous for its spooky reputation as a haunted hotspot. Not only is it said to be the most haunted place in the state of Vermont, but one of the most haunted bridges in the United States. This old covered bridge has a tale that'll send shivers down your spine. The story goes that Emily a young lady, head over heels in love, planned to elope with her sweetheart at the bridge. But for some reason, the guy just totally ditched her. Devastated and heartbroken, Emily decided to end her own life. Ever since that fateful day, folks claimed to have experienced some pretty creepy stuff around Emily's bridge. Ghostly sightings, weird noises, the feeling of being watched, and mysterious footsteps. Those are just the, the tip of the iceberg, though. This lady gets physical. People find scratches on their cars, some who dare to cross the bridge on foot have reported being grabbed or scratched themselves. And you know what? I gotta say, getting grabbed and scratched by a feisty female ghost? I don't hate the sound of that. Might have to book my ticket out there. Those towns on this list have a tragic past. It is definitely Dawson. The mining town was bought by the Phelps Dodge Corporation back in 1906, and they're the ones who really built up the town, you know, putting in homes, facilities like hospitals, stores, a cinema, even a golf course. The city had 10 mines, and the place was booming with a population of 9,000 until disaster struck not once, but twice. In 1913, Canyon Mine Number 2 was shaken by an explosion in a neighboring town, and out of the 200 86 men who showed up to work that day, only 23 survived. Then, 10 years later, Canyon Number no. 1 had a mine car that derailed into timbers and the electric trolley cables sparked, igniting the coal dust. The majority of the 123 men that died that day were children of men from the previous disaster. Parts of the city's population moved after each explosion, and the demand for coal also declined quite quickly. By 1950, the last mine in Dawson was closed, and the whole area was sold, and the structures.
structures demolished. The town was just kind of left to rot. What's especially creepy about it though is the 400 white crosses in Dawson Cemetery that symbolize the miners who died. Imagine not knowing it was an abandoned city and just going there and seeing that. You'd be like, huh? Coming in at number 9 is Ruby, Arizona. This mining town started operating in the year 1877 and it was quite rich in things like silver, gold, copper, lead and zinc. Apparently the first US post office was in Ruby which is kind of like a cute easter egg of information. What's not cute though are the three double homicides that took place aka the Ruby murders. What a plot twist, no one saw that coming. In Feb of 1920, the two owners of the Ruby Mercantile were shot and killed during a robbery. According to the locals and eyewitnesses, the perpetrators were Manuel Garcia and Ezekiel Lara and it was quite easy to identify them since they were the only two unknown Mexicans seen in Ruby at the time. Then in August of the next year, the shop's new owners, the Pearsons, were shot, killed and robbed by the same group, yet their three daughters were somehow spared. The largest manhunt in the southwest was still underway for these people and a year later in July they struck again. Two men in the gang were identified and arrested and as they were being transported in a police car, the prisoners managed to get free and kill both of the attending officers. Despite all that, the late 20s were actually the peak of prosperity for Ruby. In the 30s, the mine was the leading zinc and lead producer in the state but by 1940, the mine was closed down. A year later, the whole city was abandoned but it's been kept pretty well preserved I must say. At number 8 we have Bodie, California. Located east of the Sierra Nevada mountain range, Bodie struck gold in 1859, literally, but the hype around the town started actually growing after the Standard Company took things over in 1876. Within 3 years the population had risen to about 7 to 10,000 people and there were like 2,000 buildings in the city. But by the end of the 1870s came with a savage winter which killed hundreds of people through disease and exposure. Explosions and accidents in the mine also added to the death toll. The potential of the city brought in gamblers, miners and other corrupt businessmen and because of that there were around 65 saloons, gambling halls, brothels, opium dens and more. Some of their breweries were open 24 7 which back then was insane. But for that reason the town's reputation started going down, violence was at an all time high. Someone would get killed or robbed every day and street fights were a daily occurrence. By 1881 it was described by Reverend F. M. Warrington as a sea of sin lashed by the tempests of lust and passion. Sounds like the Las Vegas of that time. By 1912 the city started declining as mining profits decreased as well. Within a few years the newspaper, railway and last mine had all closed down and by 1915 it was a ghost town and it was actually named a national historic landmark in 1961. Filling on number 7 slot is Mystic South Dakota and honestly I lowkey just picked this one because of its name and that it reminded me of Mystic Falls from the Vampire Diaries. So Mystic is one of the many ghost towns located in the Black Hills mountain range and Native Americans have quite an extended history with the area. It was actually called Sitting Bull before it was called Mystic. The city wasn't even really a city, it started off as a creekside camp in 1876 and somehow survived a really long time. Mystic's post office was built by 1885, 4 years later it had a railway line and a second one by 1906. The town started importing coal into the hills and exporting gold out of them. And the journey definitely wasn't easy, a bunch of floods happened destroying a lot of their bridges and railway lines, the great depression screwed them royally, their sawmill burned down but they just kept bouncing back and we like that never give up energy. I don't have it but I like it. By the end of the second world war everything was going to shit and the mill was too expensive to operate and then people stopped travelling there, the sawmill was closed and so was everything else and finally the whole population was just gone. Now at number 6 is Rhyolite, Nevada. Located right near the eastern part of the Death Valley National Park, this town got its start in 1905 as multiple mining camps just sprung up out of nowhere. It was the gold rush so people were migrating to Rhyolite left, right and centre. The city had a lot to offer, it had resident hotels, an opera house and symphony, a hospital, a stock exchange but the most appealing of all its infamous red light district. Girls from San Francisco would get employed by the shops there which was kind of like a delicacy if you well. At its peak, the town had about 3,500 to 5,000 people, but it went down as quickly as it went up. The earthquake of 1906 and financial panic of the next year made money scarce and the mine stock value started crashing. They started closing down, which meant miners were also moving out of the town, and by 1920, the place was a ghost town. Coming in at number five is Kalapana, Hawaii. So, this town is part of the Puna district of Hawaii, and fun fact, it was home to the infamous star of the sea painted church. Hawaii is such a volcanic set 
best for it. Literally has 15 out of the 129 that are part of the Hawaiian Emperor Seamount chain. In 1990, lava from the vent of Kilauea destroyed most of the town and its houses. Over 100 houses were buried in the lava flow as well as Kalapana Gardens. The church was moved so as to not perish as well. The flow was so bad that even two neighboring towns were destroyed and a new coastline was formed under the 50 feet of lava flow. By 2010, there was literally only 35 houses left and now the town is closed because of new destructive lava vents. It just don't stop, do it. At number 4 is Virginia City, Montana. So this city was founded in 1863 and it was initially called Verena after the only first lady of the Confederate States, Verena Howell Davis. But the judge objected to that and called it Virginia City instead. It took a matter of weeks for the town to start booming, people coming from all over for the gold rush. But this particular region had no justice system or law enforcement, yet it had a lot of wealth. And what happens when a place has no rules and a lot of money? A lot of shit. Criminal activity was at an all time high. Road agents were killing and robbing people on the roads everywhere. They killed more than 100 people in a year. At its peak, it had 10,000 people, but of course, when the gold ran out, so did the appeal of the city. By the 1940s, Virginia City had become a ghost town and was bought by Charles and Sue Bovee, who started maintaining the ruins, and by the 50s, it was good for tourism. Fun fact the frontier woman Calamity Jane lived there as well. Woohoo! Filling at number three slot is Shanika, Oregon. Now, plot twist unlike nearly every single town on this list, Shanika wasn't a mining town. It was for ranchers and was once called the wool capital of the world. People started making camps wherever they could find water, and it was actually initially called Cross Hollow, a site properly booming at the start of the 20th century. The town was used as a transportation hub and was a center of sheep, wool, wheat, and cattle production. Their sales were like three and four million annually just for wool, which is incredible. At the start of the 1900s, there were two fires in the business district that ruined any extra hype about the city, and that's what jump started it into decline. The place had been a ghost town since the 50s, but all the buildings are still there. The hotel, Sage Museum, Shanico School, the ice cream shop, Goldie's, and more. Now, at number two is Kennecott, Alaska. So this is more of an abandoned mining camp than it was a huge city, but it was still kind of like a little town. Located next to Kennecott Glacier, a duo of prospectors traveled to the area in 1900 and found a bunch of malachite. The area had copper ores as well, and by the next year, the Alaska Copper Company took root, and by 1905, things were going really well. There was a steamship line, a railway, a school, a hospital, tennis courts, and a bunch of mines. Between 1911 and 1938, Kennecott produced $200 million worth of iron ore. That is ridiculous. For a remote little town where the nearest bit of civilization is 60 miles away, that is a lot of money. By the end of the 30s, the place was deserted since mining profits had gone down, and honestly, it was too far away from everything, and it just wasn't the vibe anymore. The population was three, and those people served as the watchmen of Kennecott. And finally, at number one is Garnet, Montana. I was so pissed, I try not to repeat any states in this video and have it all be from different states, but alas, Montana is on here twice. Damn you, America, and your 50 states. The prospectors found the semi precious red gems there and gold, which is where the city got its name from. The place was founded in the 1890s as a major commercial and residential area for mining and had around a thousand people living there by 1898. It had two barber shops, 13 saloons, a school, four hotels, a doctor's office. It wasn't really that bad to live in at all. The city became abandoned after the gold ran out, but they would have left anyway since a huge fire broke out in 1912 and destroyed half the city. That part was never rebuilt again, which is super eerie. Just imagine burnt ruins for half the town and just historical old buildings on the other side. There has to be some symbolism in that, I'm sure of it. Ghana is now on the National Register of Historic Places and you can visit it, just don't move there. And if I say any of these names wrong, I suck at pronunciation. We've been through this. Located in Alaska, this city was once filled with millions of dollars worth of copper ore. So when copper ore was first discovered on the land, workers set out to create a mine and track system. However, during this construction, tons of individuals lost their lives. Then when the mine was open, tons of miners also lost their lives. Miner 49er, sorry, I just thought of that. It's from Scooby Doo. Miner 49er. <laughs> Man. This is when the haunting started. People in the mines reported hearing cries for help from the dead miners, and their tools would mysteriously vanish into thin air. Another creepy thing that would happen is tombstones would just suddenly disappear. Apparently, travelers would see tombstones while passing through, and on their way back, the tombstones would be completely gone, as if someone just 
pick them up and move them, which is physically impossible. The city then got a haunted reputation, which scared out most of the residents. In our ninth spot, we have Mystic, South Dakota. This city first started off as a small creekside camp in 1876. Then over the years, the place began to expand. In 1885, it had a post office. By 1889, it had a rail line. And around 1906, it had a whole important export system going on. But sadly, the town was hit by a bunch of floods that destroyed their bridges and rail lines. Then the town's sawmill burned down. But no matter what tragedy hit them, they kept rebuilding and recovering. And then they kept getting destroyed. It was just like a perpetual cycle. And then it was the end of the World War II and the town didn't have enough resources to keep them going. And so the residents fled. But now legend goes that the town is cursed and that's why so many bad things happen there. In our 8th spot we have Colemanskop. Back in the early 1900s, after the first diamond was found in the area, tons of people moved to this area in hopes of also discovering diamonds. The city then became a very bustling area. There was a casino, movie theater, and school. But sadly, by the 1950s, the diamond supply was depleted and a lot of people left the area and moved elsewhere to find more diamonds. Now the city is completely abandoned and most of the buildings are flooded with sand. And I'm not talking about just like a little bit of sand here. No, there's so much sand everywhere, it's tall enough to cover your knees, which makes chances to revive the town very unlikely. Moving on to number 7, we have North Brother Island. North Brother Island is a 20 acre island located in New York City's East River. The island once was home to Riverside Hospital, which was built to quarantine people with smallpox. Since the island was so isolated from others, they thought it would be perfect to house the sick there away from everyone. In fact, Typhoid Mary spent some time there herself. Mary Malone, otherwise known as Typhoid Mary, was a cook that worked for a bunch of different families. She got her name because she was an asymptomatic carrier of the typhoid germ. As a result, she infected 51 individuals and killed three. She was then forced to live the rest of her life in isolation. Then in 1943, they used the hospital to house people with tuberculosis. But by the 60s, it was abandoned. Now the island stays that way and is off limits to the public. Coming in at number 6 we have Anemus Forks. Anemus Forks was once a popular mining town in Colorado. It was first inhabited in 1873 and 10 years later it was home to 450 residents. But in 1884 they were hit by a massive blizzard. The blizzard lasted 23 days and dumped 25 feet of snow on the town. In order to escape, the residents had to dig tunnels in the snow. And many people didn't want to return after that. By 1910, the last of the residents left the town after the last mine was closed. By the 1920s, it was considered a complete ghost town. We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with Balestrino. This Italian town used to be known for its beautiful structures and buildings. Now they are sadly dilapidated and destroyed. During the 1860s, several earthquakes destroyed the buildings and scared off half of the residents. Then in 1953, the rest of the population was evacuated due to a series of earthquakes and landslides. Of course, because of this, the buildings are now cracked, they have collapsed walls, and they're too dangerous to enter. But oddly enough, one building and one one building only still manages to remain in perfect condition, and that's the castle located at the top of a hill. It's quite odd how it's in great condition after all that. So it's thought that the castle is protected by some sort of magical force, but the rest of the town is too dangerous to visit. In our fourth spot, we have Bannock. Founded in 1862, Bannock, Montana was once just a typical gold rush town. Now, it's full of paranormal activity and was even featured in an episode of Ghost Adventures. So back in the day, gold was discovered in Virginia City which made people move to Bannock, which was nearby, in hopes of finding gold for themselves. But this caused a lot of problems. The road that connected the two towns was targeted. A lot of people were robbed or murdered along that route by a gang. Over 100 people died in only a couple of months. And in the end, the man behind all of this and the leader of the gang was in fact the town's sheriff, Henry Plummer. Dun, dun, dun. That's some Scooby Doo stuff right there. Now it's said that Henry's ghost haunts the town. So unless you want to be greeted by a ghost of a corrupt sheriff, don't go there. He's not a friendly ghost. 
Coming in at number 3 we have Virginia City. So like I just mentioned, Virginia City was known as a gold mining town, and a lot of people were killed over this gold. In fact, because the city was so small, they didn't have enough law enforcement or even a justice system. So murders were kind of the norm there. Doesn't sound like a safe place to me. Well, now it's said that the souls of the people that were murdered haunt the area. People have seen ghostly apparitions by the hanging house and by the cemetery. They also have heard mysterious voices coming from within the opera house. And one visitor was even locked inside of a room by a spirit. Now, if you are really that intrigued to visit this haunted location, they do offer tours every so often. So, there you go. But make sure you bring your holy water and Bible because there's a lot of ghosts there. In our second spot, we have Dawson, New Mexico. This city has a very tragic past. So in 1906, Dawson's mines were purchased by the Phelps Dodge Corporation. But on October 22nd, 1913, an explosion occurred in the mine and around 263 miners were killed. Then on February 8th, 1923, another explosion occurred. 123 miners were killed in this explosion. In 1950, that's when the mines were finally shot shut down. Now to this day, one of the things that still remains in Dawson is a pile of white crosses. Those represent all the lives that were lost there. And of course, whenever a big tragedy occurs, the place is usually haunted right after. And this is true. Visitors have seen lights flickering on and off. The lights apparently look like the ones on a mining helmet. And they have heard whispers and voices or have even seen ghostly figures vanish right before their eyes. And in our number one spot, we have Orador sur Glane. Orador sur Glane was once a beautiful place in France until it was terrorized on June 10th, 1944. On that day, the village was the scene of one of the worst massacres of French civilians during World War II. So since the town supported the French resistance, opposing soldiers stormed in and killed 642 residents. Men were taken to barns and shot with machine guns, whereas women were locked inside of a church and killed with explosives. It was very gruesome. On top of that, they burnt down most of the houses. The entire town was destroyed and there were very little survivors. All that's left are burnt down ruins, bricks, rubble, charred storefronts, and rusted cars and bicycles. It's quite a disturbing sight, especially knowing the horrors that- Room 206. This gives me Stephen King 1408 vibes, and I'm not sure that you're ready. Next time you visit Florida, make sure you read every customer review before you check into a hotel, because some of them might be full of ghosts. That might be a thing that you just might have to deal with. Room 206 at the Super on International Drive. Apparently, it's super haunted. Guests have reported the bed shaking in the middle of the night, probably terrible for your sleep, or freezing cold air even though the AC is turned off. And worst of all, guests have seen their bed look as though somebody was sleeping there moments before, even though it was perfectly made right before they checked in. Can ghosts squat? Is that legal? We've got a couple of spirit squatters in our room gotta move. Number nine, Disney on ice. Many families love to visit Orlando at this time of year. The theme parks there are spectacular, especially Disney World. I went once when I was younger, but you know, I don't recall ever seeing a real life Walt Disney. I don't know. Maybe it has something to do with the fact that he died in 1966. Who knows? But never say never. One of Orlando's oldest tales is that Walt Disney had his body cryogenically frozen after his death. And right now, apparently, it's being stored in a bunker underneath the theme park. I mean, that's a bit more creative than being cremated. I'll give him that. It's pretty Walt Disney of him just to freeze himself forever. A grad from the University of Central Florida Film School, Benjamin Lancaster, they actually made a film about this whole idea. It's called The Further Adventures of Walt's Frozen Head. That's a, that's a family classic, some would say. Number eight, Scarlett O'Hara's. You're going to need two pieces of ID for this next one, all right? Perhaps the most haunted bar in Florida, located in St. Augustine, Scarlett O'Hara's is haunted by a past owner. Many believe that spirit likes to make itself known to guests. That's always fun, try and go grab a pint and now you got a ghoul in front of you. That spirit is one of George Coley. Now George sadly bit the bullet one night when he was in his bathtub, so now we have a series of unexplainable events. Plates and glasses will sometimes move across the bar on their own and the jukebox keeps playing Help Me Rhonda even when it's unplugged. So that's absolutely terrifying. If you want to check it out now, be warned, because it's a full-on tourist attraction at this point. But if you go, you can pose alongside the same bathtub that George Colley died in. Yeah, how lovely is that? 
Are we going to Disney World? Nah, even better, Scarlett O'Hara's. Yeah, you're gonna love it. Number seven, Stranahan House. You don't want to be stranded at the Stranahan House. It's gonna be bad news. Fort Lauderdale has a few haunted hidden gems, and the oldest house just happens to be the most haunted. What do you know? What odds are that? What odds are that? What are those odds? There we go. The house's OG owner was Frank Stranahan, and today, if you visit ye old stomping grounds, well, you might catch Frank in a photo or two. It's said that Frank still oversees the place, and he regularly shows up in guests' photos. So this ghost likes to photo bomb. That's pretty amazing. I kind of like that. I suppose being trapped in the same house for all of eternity. It probably gets a little boring from time to time. Just to pop into a photo, throw some peace signs up, and then disappear back into the walls. Ivy Stranahan, Frank's late wife, she also has made an appearance or two. Nice, true love is haunting the same house forever. Guests have felt a cold hand on their shoulder, and her perfume still lingers in the hallway. Must have been some good strong stuff, nice. Now it's not all fun and games. Augustus Stranahan, AKA Frank's father, well, his ghost likes to throw books. It's really aggressive, so heads up for that, I guess, if you go. Cheers. Number six, the Plaza Resort and Spa. Ah, yes, kick back and relax with ghosts. It's just what you want. You're never alone, I guess, that's a plus side. The Plaza Resort and Spa sounds like a relaxing getaway until you start looking up footage of the actual resort. One's gonna, one's gonna get your attention for sure. Back in August 2013, security cameras captured late night footage of this shape-shifting ghost, some sort of spirit, some scary blob. It's bad news, really, in any regard. What happened was the original building was destroyed by fire in 1909, and current staff will testify that they've seen the ghosts of victims caught in that blaze. How they know? I have no idea, but apparently they do. No, it's a lot of details for one ghost appearance. One of the most common sightings includes a woman whose spirit is known to mess with the elevators and make items in the kitchen disappear. Okay, really? That, that last one's for sure an employee stealing food. He's like, oh yeah, I don't know. I think a ghost ate that cheesecake, boss. I don't know, spooky stuff, spooky. Number five, the Blue Anchor Pub. Another bar, another haunted bill to pay. Here we go, debit or credit. Heading over to Delray Beach, the Blue Anchor Pub was built in 1840s in London, but the wooden interior was sent to New York City and then later on sent to Florida in 1996. So yeah, these spirits must be confused. They go from Jack the Ripper to some dude wearing a Yankees hat talking to a TV. Trapped in the wooden interior is the ghost of one Bertha Starkey, who was sadly killed by her husband back in the 1840s. Now, you know Bertha is lurking about when you hear rattling pots in the kitchen, and sometimes, sometimes if you're really unlucky, you'll hear wailing in the middle of the night. Nice, again, horrible sleep at this place. The Blue Anchor sounds like a really relaxing time, but every night at 10 o'clock, the current owners will blast a ship horn to scare away her spirit. I don't know, I feel like blaring a ship horn at 10 p.m. is more jarring than some pots and pans moving sometimes. Know what I mean? I'd rather hear the pots and pans than in the middle of the night, no way. Number four, the Biltmore Hotel. Another hotel to avoid at all costs. Awesome, we love these ones. First of all, do you actually like staying at a hotel? Some people love it, some people find it super relaxing. I can't help but think about what went on in the bed before me, you know what I mean? Like, you're like, eh, why does this part of the bed feel a little bit caved in? What's going on here? Every time I'm in a hotel, I have the worst dreams and I can't sleep at all. The Biltmore Hotel in the city of Coral Gables is also one of the most haunted hotels in Florida. You've probably heard of this at some point. It all started in 1926 during initial construction. The Biltmore witnessed a foul killing on the 13th floor. The 13th floor of all floors, my God. The Biltmore was also turned into a military hotel during World War II before ultimately being closed and then abandoned later in 1968. Now, the city renovated the hotel later on in the 80s, but it didn't take long for ghost stories to start to spread. It's horrible, horrible past, I mean, more than fair. Now, of course, the most activity is on the 13th floor, so, if you do check this one out, really double down. Go to the haunted floor, you know? Don't just look outside and then book. Go in, stay a night. I can't believe some buildings don't have a 13th floor. Can you imagine that? Well, they do, but everyone pretends that they don't. You know what I mean? They're like, yeah, it's 12. I don't know, we'll see. Are you a 13th floor believer? Comment down below. Me personally, I don't think so. Because it's the 14th or the 12th. Or the 13th, I don't know anymore. No one knows anymore. It goes 11, 12, 14. You're like, really? What's the 14s? We know what's going on here, come on. Number three, 
Tampa Theater. If you're a fellow theater kid, you're also gonna love this one. Here we go. Tampa Theater opened up in 1926. The theater is now said, of course, to be haunted by a woman that was struck and killed by a carriage on the property. Imagine being hit by a carriage, it's so slow. This was actually before the theater was built, so her spirit has been there for a while. If you go to Tampa Theater today, you might catch a glimpse of that woman in a white gown walking across the mezzanine hallway. This time, without carriages whipping through, hopefully, sans carriage. Imagine telling somebody in front of you to sit down during a show, then they just disappear. You're like, I think that was a ghost. I think that was probably a ghost. It says in the playbill, ghost, so maybe that was her. Tampa Theater, of course, has leaned into these claims. Now they offer Ghosts of Tampa Theater Tour, where guests can learn about its haunted history. I'd love to do this tour. I don't know. Maybe I'll go to Florida. Who knows? I won't. <laughs> I'm like, I'm probably not going to. Number two, Key West Cemetery. A cemetery that's haunted... Get out of town, you don't say. The Beachside Cemetery was built in 1847. Now, it was built specifically for victims of a hurricane that occurred a year prior in 1846. That's terrible. Now, the cemetery is the final resting place for roughly 80,000 to 100,000 people. So yeah, I can only assume there's a ghost or two hanging out. That's extremely tragic. Walking through a graveyard at night is scary enough anytime, but Key West Cemetery is so specific that the entire time you're walking through, you feel connected in a way. Now me, personally, I'm all set. I don't want to feel connected to an 1846 tragedy. I'm all set. I'll go the long way around the cemetery and then I'll meet you on the other side, if anything. But if you're into this kind of thing, they also offer ghost tours, so knock yourself out. There you go. Apparently it's too scary for children, so that's a plus. Lines will be a little, little shorter than usual. And finally, number one, St. Augustine Lighthouse. A scary lighthouse? How? How is that possible? The St. Augustine Lighthouse is located, of course, in Florida and was built between 1871 and 1874. And it's considered Florida's first official lighthouse ever. Imagine that. Boom, let there be light. Hey, I made you a lighthouse. Enjoy. We're all good now. There have been several tragic events over the following years, seeing as it's the first lighthouse ever. It's seen a lot of history. But even during initial construction, there were several freak accidents on site. Today, said spirits are still lurking about. Sightings of shadowy figures are common, but one time, just one time, somebody saw a hand coming through the tower door. Yeah, a floaty hand, like from idle hands. How terrifying is that? Can you imagine just a Smash Bros hand just lurking near you? Several guests have reported furniture also moving around on its own, which is definitely a hazard. And one person even said that they had some of their arm hairs plucked off of them while they were in the basement. Probably that floaty weird hand just Give me one of those. Another guest felt someone grab their ankle at one point while walking down a hallway, which actually caused them to trip and fall down. So something's going on. I don't know what this ghost hand wants, but it's pretty chaotic to me, it seems. I think the ghost hand wants you to click like if you like this video. I think that's what it wants. If you enjoyed this video about abandoned towns that vanished without a trace, then you have to check out this video about more end of the world predictions. Click this video now to find out more. Your mind will be blown.